This is for somebody small. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andrei Grubacic. I'm from Anthropology and Social Change Department. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce this result of collaboration between three departments, PCC, WP, and Anthropology and Social Change. And this is a visiting scholar in residence, Cyrila Toplak, who is coming from Slovenia, from Ljubljana, from the Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, faculty, I believe it's a department of political science and political theory, but she's here to speak about something that is actually much, much larger and of truly sensational significance. So please join me in welcoming Cyrila. studies and especially my kind host uh, Professor Gubacic. Um, so um, since I don't have to really introduce myself uh, I'm just going to uh, go straight to my topic of which I could speak for about a week. so uh, I hope I can take you through this in about an hour to give you an idea at least of what has been going on uh, in uh, Slovenian social sciences, sciences and humanities uh, so, the title of my uh, uh, presentation is Shamanism in Europe, Expected Revival, Extraordinary Continuity, uh, because on the one hand, um, there is a revival, as you might expect, and on the other hand, uh, there is a really formidable continuity, and this is the one that I'm actually going to be focusing on. Uh, so, to begin with, let me say a few words about what uh, this is even all about. Uh, Slovenia, uh, just in case, because I'm far away from home, uh, to remind you, uh, it's a, a small Central European country um, in the Alps, on the one hand, on the Adriatic Sea, uh, on the other hand, and uh, Slovenia, as you can see right, is bordering Austria, Italy, Croatia, and also uh, Hungary. Two million inhabitants, 22,000 square kilometers, but uh, a very diverse country from the uh, uh, point of view of uh, um, natural conditions. Uh, there are high mountains, there is the sea, there is the Pannonian plain, uh, and these natural circumstances also play an important role in what I am about to explain. Now, it all began in late 2015 with the publication of a book entitled From the Invisible Side of the Sky uh, by uh, a man, uh, Pavel Mediuszczyk Klatscher. Um, so, there's the book on your left and on the right this is Pavel Mediuszczyk. Uh, he's 84 now, a uh, retired artist and uh, official, uh, and uh, he published this book as a book of non-interpreted, non-analyzed ethnographic material, a book of interviews actually that he did in the 1950s and 1960s with uh, the inhabitants of very remote uh, parts uh, of the northwest of uh, Slovenia, who explained to him their way of life and uh, really amazed him by what they had to say. Uh, so, my research context here, when I got the book, uh, I realized quite immediately that this was not about whatever New Age revival of uh, uh, ancient Slavic culture that is actually rather common today in post-socialist Europe, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, that this is about continuity and that this is much, much more ancient. I couldn't even begin to imagine how ancient that was. Uh, and of course, my, my first reaction was rather skeptical. How was that even possible? Uh, how could a seemingly ancient culture survive for what seemed to be centuries in uh, the middle of you know, uh, developed and civilized uh, Europe, where uh, uh, pre-Christian uh, uh, cultures and communities have been long, long gone, and where the only two 
um, uh, ethnicities having a formal uh, status of ind indigenous people are the Basques in, in Spain and France and the Sons in the polar circle. So what is this? old believers uh, a community doing here in Slovenia in late 20th century when Pavel Medvedchuk was actually talking to these people. So, uh, what really made my mind to pursue this research was that beside the book that someone might have just invented, you know, uh, there was also a material uh, heritage that was available to support the non-material heritage, about a thousand objects that had been given to Pavel Medvedchuk by these people. And they are now on public display in a regional museum, so anyone can go and see. Uh, the radiocarbon method uh, has only started on some of the objects, but obviously uh, they are very old, and he couldn't have made them. Uh, so uh, that was the issue of authenticity that I wanted to uh, bring up uh, first. Now, the other um, uh, issue or maybe answer that I was looking for uh, with regard to the question how could this even come about uh, was where these people lived. Uh, and uh, when I started to visit the sanctuaries and the part of Slovenia where they were from, I realized that actually it wasn't that impossible for them to keep their really distinct culture for all this time because they really lived in incredibly remote areas and they were really rather isolated. And in their own words, the old belief could only survive in this forgotten, remote and virgin place. Uh, it was not just remote, it was so poor uh, that no one was really interested in it. And that, what, uh, that was what made the survival or the, uh, uh, the keeping the tradition uh, that much easier. Um, now, of course, uh, I wanted to start by um, answering the question who they were by learning their name. Uh, and I learned from the material that Pavel Medvedchik made public that they had no name that they would give to themselves. They called themselves the uh, people of our faith, uh, or at best, nature worshippers. And all the other names that were given to them were really given to them by the others. Uh, so, uh, and those names were more or less pejorative, as you can see here at the, at the bottom. Uh, so they were called snake people because they worshipped snakes. Uh, they were called pagans, of course. Uh, they were called the old believers as opposed to the new faith, the Christian faith that was uh, obviously uh, younger, so to speak. They were even called the cave people uh, because they also worship in, in underground caves. That's an area where there are many underground uh, caves because of the relief. And they were called the Downy, uh, which really uh, attracted my attention uh, because um, that um, information started speaking to me um, of the possible origin of the old believers because the Downy were a tribe uh, that inhabited the Alpine area, the Eastern Alps, uh, as far back as in the uh, ancient Roman Empire. But they are a historical fact. Uh, and the memory of the old believers being called the Downy has actually been preserved uh, until the time when Pavel Medvedchik uh, spoke to them. Now, to give you an idea, This is what I would call the Old Believers Heartland. Uh, it's along the border between Slovenia and Italy. Um, it's uh, what you might call the subalpine area. So it's not like really high Alps, but it's very hilly. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's really not easily accessible. There's a lot of water, there's a lot of forest. And it's very scarcely populated. As you can see, there's like one farm and then for kilometers there's no one and there would be another farm. So people are really uh, wide apart and there are no uh, villages, so to speak, but really just isolated, very big farms. As you can, as you can see here. So on the left there would be an average farm um, and since the, uh, the nucleus, the, the uh, 
basic social unit of the old believers was the extended family. There could be 30, 40 people living on a farm. Uh, there would be the family, the uh, farm uh, master and uh, his, uh, his spouse, the, the housewife and their children. There would be their parents as well. And then there would be their uh, brothers and sisters, but only the unmarried ones. So if anyone wanted to start another family with children, they would have to move away. Uh, but still, that would make up to a family of 30 or 40, very often. Uh, so that's why they had these really big houses. Um, some very old. On the right, there is a house that was inhabited uh, about 100 years ago by one of their leaders with beautiful frescoes. This one is actually quite small. Uh, and normally, households would always have three buildings because the belief in Trinity was extremely important for these people. They really conceived of the world in trees, uh, threes. So, very briefly, to say something about their ideology, or maybe the most important things. Uh, the old believers believed in what they called the, the primal force and the primal time. They had a very sophisticated cosmogony that can be read in Pavel Medvedchik's material, the interviews that he made with them. Uh, there is the trinity that they call Trochan, uh, and it's really not just a spatial concept, connecting three dots in space, like three sacred hills or three sacred uh, riverbeds, uh, but it's also a concept related to energy, so there could be a Trochan um, between three people. Uh, they actually claimed that if the very first trochan in everyone's life, that would be mother, father and child, uh, is not functional, then that life is probably going to be very hard. Uh, so they really conceived of everything around them and themselves in these trinities. The moon and the stars, uh, the moon was much more important for them than the sun, and they had uh, incredible knowledge of everything connected with the moon and also great knowledge of astronomy, uh, which they also passed on to Pavel Nebeshchik, so we can measure that today uh, with the contemporary knowledge that we have of astronomy, and it's uh, rather amazing. Uh, they also believe that all that exists is actually alive, whether it appears alive or not. Uh, and that uh, they really needed protection and they really needed to enhance the fertility of the land that they completely depended on. And for that reason, they used at least two devices, I would call them. Uh, one is Matya, which corresponds to the Celtic men here. Uh, the, uh, upstanding uh, big stones that were put in nature and uh, um, made sacred through special ritual, rituals in order to protect the land. And snake heads were special stones that were also made sacred through special rituals that could be, um, uh, could remind us of, of baptism in a sense, because they were made in water. And these snake heads were um, also put in nature on, on special places in order to guard and protect and made more fertile the space that these snake heads were actually looking at because they took, as you will see now, they took natural stones that reminded them of snake heads and they put eyes in them uh, with a special ritual and so the snake heads could become guardians and could see the space that they were protecting. Uh, these are two examples of, uh, of snake heads. These stones were never worked on except for the eyes, so they really found them, found them in nature, mostly in riverbeds. These are the spatial torches, so that would be a map of northwest of Slovenia, where you could see, um, I mean, if you knew the places, you would recognize certain hills and, and uh, 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 hilltops and uh, underground caves that were connected into these torches, and within the space, Everything was protected and the old believers believed that the land was more fertile because they uh, uh, made it sacred that way. Well, 
I just wanted to uh, bring your attention to the quote up there. It's by one of them. Uh, because it really shows us that their community was uh, um, biological as well as cultural. Uh, so they were saying that you needed to be born into the community but also live there. Not just be born but also live there in order to really um, get deeply into their culture, in order to learn everything about their culture from very uh, young age on. It started with fairy tales and then it started with more sophisticated knowledge and then children would go to uh, um, the sort of school that they had and they would listen to their grandparents and their parents passing on the tradition uh, and some of them would even pursue the education in order to become leaders of the community. Uh, but uh, it was really important for them to be there, to be born into it, and to be there in order to be able to uh, actually consider themselves old believers. Uh, another two examples of, uh, of uh, snake heads. Uh, their religion, again very briefly. So they only had one divinity, and that was the Great Mother. Uh, a very, very uh, ancient concept. Uh, they called her Nikarmana. Uh, and, of course, um, it is uh, very much the concept that developed in uh, the Neolithic era around the uh, um, coast of the Black Sea and then came slowly to Europe, the so-called Old Europe. And uh, it's actually the same great mother all along, just changing names and transforming itself from the original Berhinia in today's Ukraine, and the ancient Greek Matar, and then the uh, um, uh, Roman Kibela, uh, and then um, it, it ended this concept in the Virgin Mary. Uh, but uh, this continuity was it, at some point trapped or, or caught by the old believers, and their conception, their interpretation of the Great Mother was, the, was Nikarmana. They called her Nikarmana. Uh, I would uh, argue that it's a, a henotheistic concept, if you're familiar with that. So uh, uh, this is a monotheism, but allowing other communities and other people to have other gods and divinities. So it's extremely, extremely tolerant co compared to uh, later uh, monotheistic religions. Uh, they were also animists and they had three sorts of, uh, of spirits that they believed in, uh, still in late 20th century. <laughs> uh, so that would be the spirits of their ancestors, the spirits of their uh, uh, former leaders who were uh, uh, already dead, and the spirits of nature. So there would be forest spirit, water spirit, uh, special house spirit, uh, and so forth. Uh, there are sacred objects and sanctuaries, stones, as you might already gather, the snake hats, for example, but, and matias, but also other stones, sacred trees, especially oaks. Unfortunately, none of them was preserved uh, so that we could still see it today, but there is a lot of memory of the sacred trees. Uh, sacred waters or sacred uh, uh, riverbeds and also underground uh, camps. Um, so, as I already mentioned, consecration and function of snakeheads. I'm just going to move on to transmigration of souls. Very important old believers concept. Uh, so, they didn't think that everything is over when a person dies, uh, because the, what they call duheads, that's an immortal part of a person, just goes on into another life form. And what is the most beautiful about that is that there is no karma, there is no spiral, there is no deserving it, because everyone actually chooses his next form by himself in this life. Uh, so uh, they, they chose their next form when they were still children, and even if an accident or a sudden death happened, they were always ready to move on into something else. And they never died, so they were, never, they were not afraid of death. Uh, and as they were saying, that is only one part of our life and everything will just go on. Uh, in their uh, practice, religious practice, uh, there were very few elements that would even remind us of Christianity, although they lived together with their Christian uh, neighbors. So there is no concept of sin, there is no guilt, 
Uh, there are no prayers. There is no mediation of priests between a particular old believer and the uh, spirits or nikmana. Uh, there is no representation in a sense that they would have a sacred place where there would be statues or paintings uh, as Christians would have, and there were no mass rituals. So rituals were rather individual and very free. Everyone just did it when they felt like it. Uh, and they had spiritual leaders, but those leaders had many other tasks. So it really wasn't, uh, they weren't there to mediate as the Christian priests were. Uh, and there were also uh, quite important deviations um, that can be uh, perceived from the ethnographic material collected by Pavel Nibyshek because of the uh, size of the area where the old believers lived. Uh, and because they were isolated and because there was no written tradition where there would be a sort of canon that would be uh, uh, created. So everyone interpreted their religion a little bit as they felt. Uh, and so there would be certain differences, uh, but then their leaders would come together regularly and they would probably, among other things that they did, also coordinate a bit these differences. So the old belief would still uh, uh, stay relatively uniform. Trying to be patient here. The only representation of the Great Mother uh, that uh, we could find so far is on your left. Uh, this is a small stone like this, claimed by one of the old believers back in the 1960s when he gave it to Pavel Nibyshek, that this is the Great Mother. Uh, there was also supposedly a stone big like this, standing in an open field for centuries, uh, that looked from the description a bit like the uh, Willendorf Venus. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this is then the only representation that we are still able to see today. And just for comparison, because I did some comparative research in Macedonia, on your right, that's the so-called Gulema Tamaika. Uh, it means the same, Macedonia, the Great Mother. Uh, it's a cult that is very widely spread in Macedonia. They even have a national holiday of the Great Mother. Uh, but uh, the situation in Macedonia is very specific because the Orthodox Church was much more tolerant towards paganism or um, pre-Christian uh, religions uh, than the Catholic Church. So they kind of just melted and uh, 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 the Macedonians today, they're not even aware how many pre-Christian elements they have in their Orthodox uh, religious practices. Uh, but as you can see, the representations are, are here extremely, extremely different. Uh, this is one of the so-called devices that the old believers had. They also call them symbols of their religion on the left. Uh, it, it's a um, fusion of an axe that was uh, uh, almost destroyed by a lightning. It was uh, uh, turned into a three, three pointed axe. Uh, there is also a snake on it, and then there are two horns, because apparently when that happened, there was also some animal that got killed by the lightning, and this is how the symbol was then put together, and was again standing outside as an as a, a object of worship for, for a very long time. And just to compare, I put on the right side uh, the uh, Berekhina symbols from Ukraine, from nowadays Ukraine. Uh, Berekhina was the original great mother, um, if I may say so, the, the start of the cult, uh, the cult uh, on the uh, uh, north coast of the uh, uh, Black Sea. Um, and these symbols are to be found today still on Ukrainian Easter eggs. Uh, so they turn into folklore. And uh, one thing that has to do with the title of my lecture is that Verekhina got extremely popular today in Ukraine again, so she has a total revival, but really for nationalist purposes. This is why they're bringing her back. Uh, the water spirit on the left and the animal protector spirit on the right. So again, these are not 
artificially worked on stones, but they're picked up in, in nature and they're consecrated to uh, their uh, function, or better, they're recognized as the representation of a certain spirit. Uh, Nikirmana herself was not a, a pantheistic concept in a sense that she would be present in everything simultaneously. She created the world according to the old believers, then she removed herself into the so-called non-world, and from there she just protects the old believers, and she can appear on the sky as a cloud, as a rainbow, uh, as some other uh, form, as uh, wind, uh, so she can be present, but never in everything, as in Pantheism. Uh, one of the most important features of the uh, Old Believers ideology is biocentrism. Um, I'm sure you are familiar with that, so uh, a biocentric view of the world is exactly the opposite of our anthropocentric view of the world today. Uh, and uh, they were really uh, saying that, uh, for example, uh, by understanding or by conceiving of their ownership of their sanctuaries as merely guardianship. So that the uh, land is there only to be passed on to the descendants, the same as it was uh, 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 got from the ancestors. Uh, and of course, they never used the word environment because they didn't think that they were surrounded by nature, they thought they were part of nature and nature was their mother, so she was to be loved. Uh, and this is why also modernization processes destroy the old religious community in Slovenia. Uh, um, and at the start of the 20th century, a railway was constructed through the region that destroyed many centuries. Then, of course, the World War I happened. The Sonso Front, that really just destroyed the land altogether, sent many people uh, uh, to flee, to be refugees when they come back, when they came back, everything was different. Uh, and uh, this was really the beginning of the end of the old believers' uh, community. So they, they survived Christian pressure and oppression for centuries, but they couldn't survive modern capitalism and modernization. Uh, just a few other centuries to um, so that you get an idea, this is the Socha River, the sacred uh, river. Uh, this is a snake cave. It's not recorded in any of the underground cave registers in Slovenia, so I was really lucky to, uh, to uh, uh, find out about it. They uh, perform special rituals in here. Uh, as you can see, there is still a stone that looks like an altar stone, in a sense, uh, right at the bottom. Uh, on this cave. And it was probably called the snake cave because there are forms uh, uh, in stones that remind us of, of snakes, but that's just a supposition. Um, this is a riverbed, Duyance, another sanctuary, of a sacred hilltop, uh, uh, they uh, did their uh, solemn bonfires for summer solstice and winter solstice up here, because these two were their most important annual uh, feasts or holidays. The Padatsi Sanctuary, another riverbed. Uh, their values, just a few of them. Uh, they were extremely modest. Uh, they really tried to use the resources that were scarce very rationally. Uh, they uh, believed that one needs, needed to be loyal to their religion, to their homeland, not homelands in one word, but to the land where their, their home was because homeland was something else. For Slovenians, until mid-20th century, homeland was also in some other country, uh, Austria-Hungary, or Italy, for the old believers. So homeland was something else. Uh, and they, they cherished their lives more than this foreign homeland, uh, where I am recognizing some sort of uh, deep citizenship, if you are. Uh, familiar with that concept because these people really consider themselves the citizens of the earth before any political entity that they might be forced to uh, uh, make part of. Uh, also, uh, very high ethical standards, as you can see, uh, and this feeling that it was probably very comfortable and very uh, uh, difficult to imagine for us with our existential angst today. 
Uh, this feeling of being protected by Nikamana, if one is good, then everything will be okay. I, I guess that was uh, uh, quite a pleasant atmosphere, a collective atmosphere to live in. Now, shamanism, which I promised, right? So finally, uh, after all this context, uh, the Deknas, uh, that's how they were called, the leaders, uh, they were uh, very complex uh, personalities uh, in the community. Uh, they had to be believers, but also good speakers. They were judges. Uh, they were highly protected. They were actually one of the taboos of the community. No one was to speak about the Dekna. No one was supposed to know who the Dekna was because it was just too dangerous. Because if the Christians found out, it was quite possible that he would be harmed or even killed. Uh, they had lots of uh, uh, tasks within the community. As you can see, so not just spiritual, but also economic, also political. Uh, they were also judges. Uh, they organized communal work. Uh, and uh, they had a certain hierarchy. Uh, so each Dekna would take care of one hosta, that's how they call their, uh, their uh, um, community, basic, basic unit. Uh, but they would also come together in some sort of council of Deknas, and three of them, we don't know whether they were elected or how they came about, three of these Deknas were actually coordinated this annual council then. Uh, and we also know, but we cannot really understand that or interpret that, that there were certain Deknas who had the so-called third power, and there were other Deknas who had the fifth power, but we do not know what this means, that, that this knowledge is unfortunately lost. Uh, so there was no democracy in all believers' community, but there was meritocracy uh, in the sense that Dignas were not elected, they were chosen. And when the new Dignas started his mandate that was to last until his death, his first task was to, uh, to start choosing the next Dignas. So he would educate, he would take into school, although this was not an ordinary school as we know it, uh, all the young uh, boys in his community. And then he would, uh, through teaching them, realize who are the three who would be most uh, promising uh, to maybe become dignas one day. And out of these three, after 10 years or even 20 years of teaching, he finally uh, chose one who was to be uh, his, uh, 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 who, who was going to be the next Dikna when he dies. Uh, so uh, they were never elected, and when uh, one of the communities, when Pavel Mevichik already knew them, um, uh, lost their Dikna to sudden death, and unfortunately, because of World War II, there was no uh, person to replace him. They rather decided to dissolve and not have a leader anymore than to elect someone. Because they were not, they said they were not sure that by election they would really choose the best man. And through this meritocratic procedure, they were absolutely sure that it would always be the best man who would lead the community. And they really put uh, all respect and authority into him. And he was really, uh, the, it, throughout the material, there was no criticism whatsoever of any victim that he would not stood up, uh, that he would not stand up to, to uh, uh, his task and, and his obligations. But he was helped by the so-called the sworn ones, and the two boys who were taught along with the future victim, they became the sworn ones, and they were consultants in a sense. So they were not put aside, but they continued to co-lead the community with the Dekna, who consulted with them, but then took all the responsibility for the final decision, always. And there was also one sworn one who was actually proposed by the community, and then Dekna decided whether he was happy with the choice or not, and they together, the four of them, actually created a sort of really archaic tetrarchy. Uh, that's a concept that was, to my knowledge, first used by uh, Celts in uh, um, the Middle East, in the antiquity, uh, in uh, uh, one of the states that they created over there through the, uh, in, in the time of the Great Migration periods, 
Uh, but uh, so uh, that was actually a rule of the four with Bechner being in uh, the ultimate authority and taking all the important decisions after consultation. Division of powers then, uh, there was Dechner, he was held by the sworn. Uh, there was of course Nikermana who ultimately decided on everything. Uh, and uh, uh, they asked her to decide by uh, um, a certain form of, of logocracy, of uh, uh, choice or of decision by Nota. Um, uh, for example, if Bechner was to uh, judge a criminal, uh, uh, someone who would really do something uh, uh, very bad, like kill someone, or, or there would be a rape or something, uh, he would prepare three pots uh, with um, uh, a buckwheat flour in two, and in one there would be powder of uh, mortally uh, poisonous mushrooms. And then he would ask the person, the criminal, to choose from the three. So he would, the criminal would in a sense decide on his own uh, life or death, but it was actually Nikurmana, of course, who was deciding, the divine uh, power. And there was the black guard. Uh, the black guard was what we could call today a repressive apparatus of the old believers community. Uh, they had to defend themselves from the uh, aggression and violence of the Christian majority. Uh, so they had these terrorist cells of the three, again, who were again sworn into utmost secrecy and who would act if there were acts of violence against the old believers by the Christians. So the Dignan would be informed, he would decide what to do, and the black guardians would go and wait for the guy in question and maybe uh, beat him up, uh, kill him, but beat him up and teach him a lesson so he would leave the old believers alone. Uh, that way they didn't only rely on Nikurmana for protection, but they also protected themselves. This is where Bechner's pledged that they were going to work uh, and act and live in the public when they started their mandate. Uh, and it was a very solemn ritual where they actually pledged that they were going to be good Bechner's with uh, uh, this Levi's. Uh, one of their seals uh, that has to do with the fifth power and the third power. Uh, that's what, as far as the explanation goes, but unfortunately we don't know what it is. Uh, the black guard stick, uh, it was preserved, but we don't know what, what they used it for. So we uh, um, can only, only speculate. Uh, and uh, as you can see, on top of it there's a trochan, there's a triangle. Uh, so it was, it was consecrated. Uh, about the political life, uh, just a few aspects. Uh, so they didn't believe in decisions being made by the majority, although the majority was consulted, was, was being heard. Uh, they were well organized uh, territorially and also uh, socially. Uh, there were people who were very important for passing on the tradition, the so-called uncles. Those were the unmarried brothers of the, uh, in the household. They had a bit more time than the master. And so they, they spent a lot of time in the company of children and they taught them, uh, uh, told them fairy tales and, and so forth. And the uncles were the ones who were actually left on the community when Pablo Nevisce came to them in the 1950s. There were no proper families left any longer and that's why the tradition was not being passed on uh, anymore. And that's why uh, despite the secrecy, they decided at the very end, uh, they said, we were going to go down in history without even a memory of us, so now we're going to tell you, our young men at the time, about us so that at least there is a memory preserved of us. Um, so the farms, as I said, were isolated, but they were not isolated on the other hand, uh, because they were connected in a much, much larger net uh, each farm had its own star, each farm had its own sacred tree, uh, each farm was constructed in Trochan, so it was protected by the, the Trinity. Uh, each farm had the, the special stone, the Jarkamen, it's a fire stone that was built into the, the fireplace, the center of the house. 
Uh, and of course, they were also protected by the community via the black guard and, and the workers. Um, so I already told you something about the justice. It was on one hand an eye for an eye, on the other hand divine judgment concept. Education was totally non-institutional, it was non-dogmatic, it was happening within the family, and it was also happening through the Dignas who organized the so-called uh, Bratinas. Uh, these were teachings for young boys, and then they wouldn't be that young anymore, but they would continue to come because apparently they're talented, and then one of them would end up being the next day. And of course, the old believers had to go to the ordinary Christian schools as well. They, they couldn't escape that. And they were all under their um, uh, clothes. They were all wearing a crimp, uh, a special protective stone that would supposedly protect them from bad influence of the Christian faith and of the majority teachings. Uh, their health, uh, they actually had uh, some sort of public health. Uh, healers had a very high status and some big nights were also healers. Uh, and whenever someone was sick, uh, they would first inform the day clerk who always knew where particular healers were because healers were always on the move and then he would send for the nearest healer. Uh, and of course the healers uh, were working on the animals and on people without any difference. Uh, there was no separation between the two. Uh, and people also did not expect the healers although they were very highly uh, uh, in the, the, they were held in very high esteem. They didn't expect the healers that they would heal everyone every time. So it was also Nikramana who decided whether one is going to live or whether one is going to die, and people just accepted that. Uh, their survival strategies as a community were rather sophisticated and successful. Uh, so they engaged in barter when it was necessary. They actually had a, a sort of a system of mutual loans that was managed by Dignas. They Dignar was also in charge of the seed bank that he, he distributed seeds when it, there was a necessity. And they created a sort of a parallel economy, actually, uh, when the taxes were too high. They would just hide uh, whatever they did uh, in order to uh, to uh, keep more resources for, uh, for their families. Uh, even some sort of uh, archaic biopolitics uh, by which they try to keep, to preserve their community. So they encouraged, but they didn't uh, prescribe uh, inter-community uh, uh, marriages. It was desirable that they would marry within the community. And they had a special ritual called the Navizina, uh, which could be translated into something like tying someone to the community. So if a child was born with a very obvious physical handicap, uh, the Dekner might decide not to perform Nagazina on the child, and then that child probably would not uh, get married within the community. So they actually even uh, try to pay attention to their gene pool, in a sense. Uh, their society, uh, so great respect for ancestors, a wonderful attitude toward children compared to the Christian majority. They didn't believe in physical punishment. Uh, they raised their children very mildly and kindly. They actually said that one should look at wildlife in order to be inspired what maternal love is. Uh, and they also taught children to have a very uh, binary attitude towards the others that is to help them or to leave them alone, but not harass them or enter into any other form of problematic relationships with them. Uh, of course, it was a patriarchal society, uh, so the division of roles between women and men was quite strict, and women were considered not to have the strength and stamina and courage uh, to perform the most uh, exposed roles, that is to be the Ignaz and to be black guards and to be the sworn ones. But they had their own rituals and men knew nothing of them. Uh, so it was really too bad that Pavel uh, Medvedev only got to talk to men uh, because there is a whole other part that we actually didn't really learn much about. Uh, so even if patriarchal society, I think it, would still, it could still be called a feminine culture, 
in a sense that men were really not ambitious, they were not competitive, they were really very much focused on uh, relationships and uh, uh, they really, uh, it, it was really a soft, soft community, a soft uh, 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 culture. Uh, and uh, relations between genders were also guided actually by, uh, by this, uh, you see these uh, abbreviations there, and they stand for Slovenian words for uh, loyalty, love, honesty, goodness, and pride. So these were the five features that were necessary to every marriage to work. Uh, and this is what Gehmer preached or recommended in a sense. Uh, so, as you may uh, notice, no humility, uh, which would be extremely big in Christian majority, right? But pride and goodness and loyalty and love and honesty. Uh, they also had a very different attitude towards sexuality compared to the fellow Christians around them. Uh, and it is perceivable in the very etymology in a sense, because they call their uh, sexual parts natura, which is explainable, uh, as opposed to Christians uh, for whom the Slovenian word for sexual parts is shame, something to be ashamed of, of course. And uh, also for the children out of wedlock, which was like the worst sin in the Christian uh, society up until mid 20th century. Uh, for the old believers, it was merely a product of irresponsibility, <laughs> so they, they didn't think uh, that, that uh, badly about it, or not at all. <laughs> uh, the Christian majority, I already hinted at that, the relations were very complex and, and difficult. The old believers minority needed to defend itself, but it also needed to uh, uh, adopt certain compromises in order to uh, uh, survive. The most important compromise that there was, was um, when they were faced, that's what they explained to Pavel Medvedchik, when they were faced with the second wave of Christianization in the ninth century by the Franks, that was very violent, they had to decide whether they were going to leave, whether they were going to adopt the Christian faith, or what. And leaving was no option because they would leave their, their sanctuaries behind. And it was Nikomana who had decided where the sacred land was, so how were they to know where the sacred land is in the new unknown, unknown area. They would not adopt the Christian faith because it was ethically inferior to the old believers' uh, uh, beliefs. And so they opted for pretending to be Christians. And they went to church like three times a year. Uh, and uh, when the priest was not happy, they would say, oh, but we're so busy and we live so far away, we need to walk four hours to get to church. And then the priest would say, but why don't we build a church new to you? And then they would boycott the construction of the church and they would be sick and they would come and they wouldn't want. And, and there are still like whole river valleys in the northwest of Slovenia where there is not one religious object ever constructed throughout history. They just wouldn't let it happen. Uh, so they were very efficient in that. And of course, uh, they, uh, uh, there were people who passed uh, on the other side, so to speak, who became Christians. And the old believers, they said that it was comprehensible because the pressure was so hard and sometimes violence was really awful. Uh, but on the other hand, those were not the real old believers to begin with, because the, the real old believers, they would stand beside, uh, behind their convictions until the very end. That was their attitude. Uh, so cohabitation was sometimes difficult, sometimes less difficult, because Christian neighbors didn't even know that the old believers were old believers. Uh, there were survival compromises, as I said, and there is also a very tragic, tragic history of, uh, of the violence between the two uh, communities. Now, my possible working hypothesis, uh, I am not working with the old believers as a religious minority because they claim their set themselves that their faith is actually a way of life, much more than a religion. And there are sufficient differences in their way of life compared to the Christian majority that this is not an option to my view. Uh, they were more than a secret society too. 
because uh, they, they were not elitistic, they didn't have a special aim for creating a secret society, uh, and uh, it was a biological and a cultural community, as I said. It was neither an intentional community for pretty much the same reasons, uh, but I do think that the Old Believers community could be theorized as a Foucaultian uh, heterotopia on the one hand, and maybe even as indigenous people, uh, which is uh, something that I hardly dare say is to be here right now and survive in the scientific community. Uh, so very briefly through uh, Foucaultian concept of heterotopia, because I'm sure you're familiar with it, uh, Foucault theorized this concept back in the 1960s as other spaces. So spaces within the society that are inherently and fundamentally different and allow people to live by different rules. To you know, sum it up very simply. Uh, here is a, a quote that I think uh, really resumes it by uh, Foucault himself from the Seminal Taste. Uh, he came up with uh, what he called heterotopology. Uh, so these are the main features of heterotopias. Uh, they are supposed to exist in all traditional all modern societies as you know, other places, as places that perform other functions uh, for a time or permanently. They may change their function. Uh, there are seemingly incompatible spaces that are being juxtaposed in a heterotopia. An example of that would be a theater, uh, or would be a, 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 a community space where in the morning you have a presentation of a new vacuum cleaner, and in the evening you have a meeting of the uh, civic initiative on whatever, and uh, so it's always the same space but having very different functions. Heterotopia is also a heterochrony, so it means that uh, it leads by a different time. Not, it's not just space, but also time that is different. They're, all, they're open and closed, they may be isolated and maybe vulnerable. Uh, and indigenous communities are precisely a very good example of that. Uh, and at the end, categorization proposed by Foucault, they may be a space of illusion, they may be a space of exclusion, and they may be a space of perfection or compensation. That is, a heterotopia may be a place where something completely different is happening from the rest of society. Uh, it may be a place where something better is happening, that there is an improvement of what the majority is doing around it. Or they may, there may be something that actually resembles more a dystopia uh, than uh, anything else. So just a few examples for you to imagine better what this is all about. Uh, perfection, compensation, colonies, uh, uh, religious communes, uh, transition towns, if you're familiar with that initiative. Uh, Socialist Yugoslavia, in a sense, was, was a heterotopia because uh, with its, its system of uh, self-management, it really tried to be uh, uh, a better place for socialism than all the other socialist countries that also adopted that system. Illusion, very pure spaces that never survived for long, where everything was completely different, like the Paris Communion or the Free Territories or the Old Believers region. And of course, exclusion, that's something that we get to see a lot today. Prisons, refugee camps, or uh, rehab centers, these are also heterotopias. The Old Believers heterotopia, uh, it was of uh, actually continuity between the traditional and the uh, contemporary or modern, but it was always an ethical corrective for the majority. So it was really a heterotopia of uh, illusion. And it literally lived in uh, a heterochrony because the old believers lived by a moon calendar, not by the official calendar. And they had other feasts and they had other celebrations and they just lived by different time. Uh, now, uh, the indigeneity of the old believers, the potential, uh, possibility of seeing them that way. Uh, there are just a few features that I think really point in that direction, general features, uh, oral tradition, uh, shamanism, animism, uh, primary settlement. They have extended and precise and uh, detailed memories of how they were the first ones to come to the northwest of Slovenia. 
their attitude towards nature, their taboos, they had quite a few taboos, uh, and their use of psychotropic plants, uh, quite typical of indigenous uh, uh, people, so the, they also did that. And I, I saw literature on um, indig indigenous use of uh, uh, psychotropic plants, uh, claiming that there is absolutely no uh, uh, proof or evidence that mushrooms would be used in Europe where the old believers, that's, that's what they claim, that's what they told about, and they should definitely use mushrooms for that purpose. Uh, they have as shamans, uh, again, uh, they, they really fit into the shamanic model, the definition of a, of a shaman. Uh, now the question is uh, rather in the precise you know, geographical and historical circumstances, what sort of shamans the Bihnars actually were? And again, there is some evidence pointing in the direction that there could be a, a link to the uh, Celtic culture because it's really uh, consistent with the settlement of this area in the antiquity and that uh, Bigners could actually look a bit or a lot like the Celtic Druids. Uh, of course, we have the problem here called Interpretatio Romana. Uh, that is the fact that it was the Romans who wrote about the Celts extensively or almost exclusively, so it's really hard to know what was uh, true and what was just war propaganda on the side of the, of the Romans. But they even fit their, their descriptions. And now some more uh, representation or some, some, more, some more pictures for you to, to be able to imagine better what this is all about. The ritual masks uh, that the old believers also use. This is Nihunza, a snow mask uh, for, uh, to, to chase the winter away. A uh, rattle, again very typical uh, device uh, used by many indigenous uh, uh, shamans. Uh, the clay pipe uh, that the Vignas used exclusively, see the form of a of triangle. Um, the Bruschin, uh, no one knows what this is about. Uh, the old believers called it a device. Uh, it was out in nature, so it was worshipped in, in a way. Uh, see that uh, the, uh, there is this iron sculpture or thing on a, on a stone pedestal that stones look like grinding stones or uh, it's, real, it's really hard to know and of course they're protected by three, three stones as you can see at, at uh, uh, the bottom. Uh, so, uh, in Slovenian language this word does not mean anything. Um, another shamanic element, very typical, the Duente Sanctuary, the beautiful riverbed that I showed you earlier. In the memory of the old believers, it was divided very uh, into a very complex uh, division of worlds. So there is the underworld, it's the midworld, the upper world, the uh, subworld, the non-world, the uh, side world. They had altogether nine different worlds uh, that the Dehnars most probably traveled to, just as shamans worldwide um, mostly uh, do. So this is a, a scheme of Duetze as it was divided into uh, the world. Another unknown device, the stalk. Uh, we don't know what it served uh, for and what it meant. It was uh, uh, left outside and it was worshipped in, in a way. Uh, now, there are certain hints at the possibility of uh, existence of what I would call an alpine culture mm -hmm. because there is a continuity of the remnants of these cultural elements uh, towards the west uh, until uh, French alpine territory. And it's consistent with the settlement of the Celts, of the Gauls. Uh, so th there is another reason to think that that may be a sediment of uh, a pre-Christian, pre-Slavic uh, uh, culture that was present in this territory um, in, in the antiquity. So I'm, I'm just citing the archaeological findings that are consistent with, the, uh, uh, with this uh, theory that actually leads us to uh, the indigeneity of some sort uh, of uh, the uh, old beliefs. Uh, one of the most important 
proofs of that could be the situla, the, the bucket, uh, that was uh, uh, found uh, in the Old Believers uh, uh, region. Uh, with the inscription, as you can see on the right, Locano Necrimano. That's the only instance ever that we found this, the, the, the word Necrimano uh, written anywhere. And the archaeologists claim, and it's supported by the, uh, the dating method, that this is a Venetic situla, so that it uh, belongs to the tribe Veneti that inhabited this area in the time of the ancient Roman Empire, and it was in the European tribe of uh, Celtic uh, origin. So the only time that we find Necrimano written somewhere is on a Celtic Venetic uh, uh, point. Now, another find that I made personally is related to the objects that were given to Pavel Nilischek. Uh, he got all sorts of objects. You can see the ritual objects now, but he also got farm tools, many of them that were just offered to him by the old uncles. And uh, so uh, uh, he published an article on these farm tools, a special uh, sort of them called Veniki that is no longer in use because uh, people just don't work that way anymore. It's not important what they before. But uh, in any case, in 2003, he published an article on these farm tools, and he also published this list of signs that uh, were actually engraved on the farm tools. Uh, and the old believers who had given them to him claimed that the signs were actually initials of the farms that the tools were coming from. Because people were working together and they didn't want to mix up their tools, so they would put the initials of the master of the farm or, or of the farm name that would go from one generation to another. And when I saw this list, I said, but Pavel, these are letters. These are not just signs. This must be some alphabet. Uh, and this was out, published for more than 10 years, and no one noticed. No one just paid attention. Uh, and I... Uh, um, uh, Photographed, recorded very carefully all the farm tools, all the signs. I identified 25 of them. And in this list of uh, ancient Roman uh, scripts, the uh, so-called uh, Italic scripts that were in use in the uh, Roman Empire, uh, I found 17 of them without modification. Uh, they were mostly present in the Venetic, Venetic alphabet on the left, but also East Retic, and Retia is, was the ancient Roman province that was just west of Venetic, where the old believers lived. So, another proof that this may be really very old. Uh, this is one of the farm tools. You see the Venetic letter is Z on it. And another one, uh, right there on the right side, there is the letter M. Can you see it? On the, very, on the far right. And so from 25, 18 belong to these two alphabets. And there is their vocabulary too. Uh, about 50 words that are not of Slavic origin or Italian origin or Austrian origin or Croatian origin or uh, any origin that will make sense in the area and would be consistent with migrations in the modern era. So these words still wait for us to actually identify their origin, but they may well also be of Celtic origin. Uh, it's really something for the linguists to say. And the old believers, they had, of course, their Christian names because they were officially Christians. So there would be Johns and Thomases and Peters and whatnot. But among themselves, they also had their own secret names. And those names also sounded totally, totally foreign, not Slavic. And I'm coming now to from the continuity to the revival. So why I think it's really important to study this today, uh, just like one of the old believers said to Pavel Medvedchik, you come to us as handy as new shoes before winter. <laughs> uh, because now we're about to disappear, and this is how grateful we are, we are that you're here, that we can pass our memory on. And I think they also come to us as new sho shoes before winter. This is the, not just winter of our discontent, but winter of the way we live, I think. 
the um, post-socialist countries in Europe in particular are really disillusioned with the political and economic system that we adopted uh, almost 30 years ago. And uh, people are hungry and thirsty for alternatives and populisms are on the rise. Uh, and the old believers have really uh, important and, uh, and uh, pacifist and, and beautiful messages for us to pass on. And on the other hand, they, they represent our tradition, so they also appeal to uh, uh, people who are rather conservative. Uh, and uh, uh, it's no surprise that the general public in Slovenia is rather crazy about this. Uh, and all sorts of manipulations and abuses are already coming up uh, um, related to uh, the old believers. Uh, so, for example, um, who is going to speak in their name? Uh, who is there to claim that they're actually old believers? And yet there are people today who just call themselves, themselves old believers and uh, they uh, promote what they interpret as old belief uh, without really having any clue or doing any research on uh, uh, the material collected by the power of uh, The most common manipulation or, or uh, misinterpretation is of course that this is all Slavic tradition. So, and it points in the direction of pan-Slavism, oh, Slavs, let's go together, let's get together and be stronger, and it's actually cultural racism. So, uh, this is something that is, that is quite, quite uh, uh, strong. Uh, then, on the other hand, there are people who just want to uh, benefit from it. We're in capitalism, right? So, we already have Nikramana LTD registered, a company. No one would dare register Jesus LTD or Allah LTD, but Nikramana right away. Uh, and uh, there are really strange things happening in the old believer sanctuaries because now everyone knows of them. So people go there and perform voodoo and what they think are old believers' rituals and whatnot. Uh, and of course, the scientific community is very skeptical and reserved and waiting, as usual in Slovenia, for the uh, uh, foreign scientists to give some recognition to this, and then it will be uh, uh, important for the Slovenian scientists uh, as well. When I think that this actually surpasses Slovenian science because it's part of European heritage, and uh, I hope to find colleagues in Europe with whom I will work in the future so that we can really uh, uh, give this subject its time. Uh, and so, the, a call that cannot be silenced, this is another quote from, from the Old Believers uh, interviews. They used to call each other from one hill to another because they were so far away, they were so isolated. And they believed that their calls would actually uh, uh, become trapped in trees and stones and water. And when you would walk around and if you listen carefully enough, you could hear the calls of the people who were long gone. Uh, and now they're calling to us to my view, uh, to hear what they had to say about the, their attitude toward nature, about their, uh, their way of living in a community, about their sense of tolerance and, and solidarity, and I only hope for Slovenians uh, to be able to, to hear that call. Uh, just a few examples of what is going on today. So this is an installation in front of one of their sanctuaries, the, the uh, an underground cave. Uh, so they put a stone and then they would build like a, like a Buddhist thing on it <laughs> uh, with smaller stones. And then uh, someone found something that they thought probably it was Ashura because Ashura is, a, uh, for all believers, a piece of wood that would be found in the water and according to its form would, have, would be a demon a good demon or a bad demon. So I, I'm sure you know, uh, you, you, you can find some parallels here with some other religions, uh, very ancient ones. So this is what you can find in, in uh, their sanctuaries now. Or this, what is this? Something hanging in the Padence sanctuary? When I first saw this, I was completely beside myself because I thought, oh, maybe this is evidence that they're still here, they're still worshipping. Maybe that's something that they didn't tell Pavel that they were doing, but this is what they, they, they do. And then after months, we found that someone was bragging 
that they actually hand them there because they thought it was a cool thing to do. So this is this is what's happening to you. But this is also happening, and this is what I'm adding this presentation with. On the 21st of June this year, Pavel and I decided to uh, lit a bonfire because the summer solstice was their largest, most important holiday. And Pavel uh, looked through his archives and he found one of the locations where they did it. So we reignited the bonfire after 103 years on the same spot. And it was a really, really magical evening. We didn't pretend that we knew that we were doing whatever we were doing or that we were um, imitating them. We were just there and we were just trying to enjoy it. And it was, it was really a wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, I, for me, the, the most beautiful moment was looking on the other side of the Socha Valley uh, onto the high plateau where many old believers lived in, in the old times. And on the 21st of June, uh, that used to be uh, a big holiday. It, it was, you probably know, later replaced by the Christians with the 24th, the St. John's. Uh, that was also the night where bonfires were being lit, and then the communists moved that to uh, May 1st, actually. That was our tradition of bonfires. And so on the other side of the Socha Valley, at least three bonfires were burning on the 21st of June. So uh, uh, Paolo and I were saying, well, the old belief is not dead, and uh, whether it's back or it's always been there, it's just wonderful that uh, this is this is happening again. And we even managed to uh, make a bonfire with actually three flames. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> now, you may have questions, or maybe I've totally exhausted you. <laughs> but if there's anything I can explain, or maybe I was going too quickly, or I wasn't really clear about it. Or, Please. Um, I was wondering if you could share, if you know, like what their what they farmed and what they ate, what they survived off of. Uh, they actually uh, transmitted quite a few recipes to Pavel, uh, so I actually tried to recreate some of their dishes. But those were men, so they had no idea of quantities. It was very approximate. So, uh, it's not easy to to imitate today. Uh, buckwheat uh, and uh, uh, barley uh, and uh, uh, fruit trees, uh, very little meat, that was more for holidays, uh, but they kept sheep, they kept goats for milk uh, and uh, a lot of beans uh, and um, not that much of a potato or vegetables in the sense that Know, we consider vegetables today, uh, like uh, zucchini or salad or whatever, but very, very traditional, uh, very, very, very poor cuisine, uh, like uh, Italian cucina povera. It was, it was really that, with very few ingredients, the housewives, the, they were trying to do the most. Uh, because those are really more or less the poorest people in in, in the region, so it was hard for them to survive. Although, uh, interestingly, they, they on average they didn't have as many children as the average Christian Christian family. Hmm. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, at the end, you're sort of giving some criticisms of like how this uh, the knowledge has been sort of like appropriated by different people mm -hmm. and. But then also your talk is about revitalization and it seems like you're kind of also hopeful as to like having this knowledge come to light and what it can mean. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to maybe just give a little bit more about that. Like mm -hmm. what do you see as something that can happen that is like really positive and meaningful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, uh, my aim here is really um, keeping the memory and really being able to uh, give some answers as to what the old belief was about and what is the importance of that in Slovenian history in, in general. 
Uh, I, can, I do not claim that uh, we could become all believers today. I think that would be horribly pretentious because if you uh, live uh, an urban life and you do not depend on nature the way they did, you cannot um, develop this awe-inspiring attitude toward nature. Because they really, they, they uh, um, repeated that many times to Pavan. Uh, they really gave themselves to nature and they just hoped that Nikramana would be good to them because they were good and, they would, and she would let them survive from one year to another. So this is a frame of mind that we cannot really enter uh, today. Uh, and uh, so I just really want uh, to happen what Pavel took upon as his mission, that they wouldn't be forgotten. Uh, and that we would realize what they were and how important they were because uh, I already see that there are certain chapters of Slovenian history that will need to be rewritten because we didn't, we didn't encompass their part uh, because they were so secret. Uh, and uh, so I'm not, I'm not hoping for revitalization of the old believers community in the sense that we would try to be old believers today, uh, but I think that there are uh, uh, sustainable uh, attitude towards nature and their, um, their, their uh, relationships, the, the way they consider um, how people should behave to each other, how, how they should be you know, uh, honest and, and loyal and, uh, and uh, uh, proud and, and loving. Uh, I think that's something that does not lose uh, force or power. So and it, we need to be reminded of it. Um, and uh, maybe it's easier for people to be reminded through the channel of tradition, through something that was already there, that actually grew out of our land, because the New Age revival, as I called it, uh, it's wrapped with all sorts of imports. In Slovenia, there are, you know, Hare Krishnas and, and all sorts of traditions imported from all over the world, but I don't think we can really get deep enough into these traditions to really internalize them because they were developed in different natural environments and I think it's really precious that we found this that was that grew out of our natural environment and uh, it's really kind of easier for us to be socialized into. Uh, so that's, that's my ambition and certainly not any personal one because I got my full tenure, so I, I don't care about publications or you know career or whatever. Uh, but I have to admit that the old belief also brought a lot of opportunity for personal growth to me since I started researching this. So uh, I, I think it's just a, a wonderful research topic and and something to pursue for for a long time, probably as you saw. I mean the dimensions of that are tremendous. <laughs> Um, so you speak of them as in the past tense yes. and say that the, the spirit of Pavel obviously spoke to still some of them. Exactly. What happened? Was it just the wars that there was no one to pass on to? Uh, exactly. When, when Pavel came to them, they were basically just uncles. So there were no young people to pass the tradition on. And that's why they chose him to, to adopt him partially. Uh, and uh, he's now an old man, uh, and uh, he had to wait for for 50 years because he pledged he was he was pledged to silence. Uh, they all they all wanted to be dead before this was published, uh, and they said you only can publish this in 2007 when a new era was, will start for humanity because the moon will have the crescent moon will have the horns turn towards the earth, and he thought what. <laughs> Uh, but they knew in the 1950s that this was going to be the uh, orientation of the moon in 2007 because it actually was. Uh, that was their knowledge of astronomy. And uh, one of your colleagues here pointed out, and I didn't think of it, that uh, 2007 was also the year when the iPhone came out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so yes, uh, today, uh, Pavel is the, as far as I know, only living link with the actual old believers because he, he spoke to them, he knew them, he saw them. Uh, but there are still people who remember their grandparents being strange very well. Uh, so I do a lot of field work still. 
because now that Pavel is rather famous, uh, people call him up all the time and they say, oh, you know, I'm sure that guy is an old believer. Mm -hmm. uh, and as he doesn't do field work anymore, he sends me, so I go and, and I do interviews. Uh, and I even came upon people who actually still perform the rituals. Uh, they do not know why, but they were taught so by their grandparents, so they just go on and they do it. And I also started research recently in, on the Italian side of the border because Pavel couldn't pursue it during socialist Yugoslavia because it was the sort of Iron Curtain and you know, East West, and it was for the Italians, he was like a spy, so uh, they were really paranoid about it. And, uh, but now, of course, there is no border at all. And it seems that there, are, there is even more memory preserved on the Italian side, mm -hmm. uh, with the Slovenians living now in, in Italy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue there. And that's also, I think, the right direction because it's westward, right? And this is uh, probably uh, 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 the, the Alpine culture that I was talking about. Yes, yes please. What region of it in the is that in? Uh, actually, that would be um, um, uh, Friuli. Um, um, the Julian region, Friuli, Julia Veneto, uh, the north of Veneto, so it's, it's really by the Slovenian border. You mentioned that uh, the young children were, uh, you know, started within the culture with like fairy tales. Did were any of the fairy tales recorded? Yes. And yes. Um, were there any songs? Uh, songs. Uh, fairy tales, quite a few of them, several books published by your father, so we do have quite a few fairy tales. And uh, I'm, I'm aware of their importance as you know, the, the source of information still. Uh, but music, unfortunately, is lost to us. We do know that they use the clay pipe, kabarza, but people today, they, some people make them again. Uh, the way they think the overlivers made them, and they try to uh, to play them, but we don't know what sound they had for them. We only knew we only know that they not played them, so they probably had some ritual importance too. And uh, um, there is a, a wonderful uh, quote in in Pavel's material uh, when one of his interviewees is remembering the old times when it was so wonderfully silent. There was no noise of machines or the railway or, or the cars, and the only thing that one could hear uh, were the clay pipes and uh, uh, were people calling each other. And uh, uh, it was uh, it seems really when you read this that it was like a, like a different different uh, century, but it was only a few decades ago. I wondered about the call, you know, like if they were lyrical call callings out across here, but it's gone. Yeah, yeah, I, it's just speculations now. They were certainly calling each other uh, by their names when someone got lost or something, but uh, maybe they were also saying something else. Uh, the old believers, uh, the ordinary old believers didn't take part in rituals that were performed by Dignas and the sworn ones. Uh, for example, when they consecrated the snake heads, it was just for the four of them. It was not like for the entire community. And some of the rituals they could just see from afar. And they all reported to Pavel that Dignas was saying something all the time. That he was, he was repeating something or he was saying some magic words. And the healers also had all kinds of them. Of magic words to say when they were healing, but unfortunately it was not it was not preserved. And um, the last data of one of their communities actually kept notes in three notebooks, and these notebooks I will never stop searching for <laughs> uh, because uh, when he died rather suddenly, apparently his nephew came uh, from town and took them. And so the trace of these notebooks was lost in Chividale. It's a small town on the Italian side of the border. And I was there in the archives and the library and uh, with the antiquaries and so far nothing. But I'll keep searching because that would be, that would be really amazing if we could find some written, written tradition too. Well. 
Thank you very much for attending and uh, uh, listening. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'm always uh, uh, to be found on, through Andre uh, on mail. If I can help you with your research, maybe I'll gladly do it. Uh, and uh, all the best. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.